Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna take a look at what's in this box here. It's the Nabu, I think I'm saying that right, personal computer made by Nabu Manufacturing Corporation out of Ottawa, Canada. It was a bit of an unknown personal computer that was very short-lived up in Ottawa, Canada, and it has some very interesting characteristics about it. Very recently, a seller has recently put a whole bunch of these up for sale, brand new in box, so I purchased one, and let's take a look at this thing together. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So as I mentioned in the intro, this is a computer. It's basically new in box, at least from my understanding. I think the seller did open it up to test to make sure it worked, but otherwise this thing has never been used. And if you're still interested in getting one of these, I'll say up front that at the time of making this video, there is still plenty available. This is the box exactly as it arrived here in the basement. I just peeled off the shipping label. It's new old stock, but it is tested. So I think the seller actually peeled the original tape off, tested it, and then taped it back up again. I heard that the seller has over a thousand of these for sale. So if you're interested in getting one of them, at least at the time of this video, there are plenty still available. Although we'll talk about some reasons why you may not actually wanna buy these once we open this up and take a look at it. So let's do a little bit of an unboxing here. Cut into the tape. Okay, there's a glimpse of what's inside the box here. So we have the original Nabu keyboard here, which I can hear a little bit of a ping. I'm gonna say that that's an Alps keyboard. We have the user guide, which uh, it's a little curled up, but otherwise seems okay. Looks like the seller stuck this little bit of note here. It's funny because it says, uh, Go to the website, wait 10 seconds. <laughs> then the info is on the right side. What's in here exactly? I'm assuming it's just gonna be the power cord. Some kind of cord. It looks actually to be some DIN cables. Hmm, interesting. There's a little flyer here. This is definitely not retro. So for some modern streaming service, must be uh, something that the seller offers. And then lastly, inside the box is the 8-bit computer itself. Now keep in mind that this Nabu personal computer is from the 80s at some point. I'm not sure the year exactly. We'll have to see what the chips say on the inside, but I think it was like on the earlier side of the 80s, like around 83, 84, maybe something like that. And there we have it, the Nabu personal computer. So I haven't really talked about what is this thing even. So the general idea was that this computer combined with another box that looked basically the same as this would plug into your cable TV network and it would allow this thing to be basically a diskless computer that would boot up and receive all the software and games on demand right over the cable TV network. But inside here, from my understanding, this is the actual computer. It has a Z80 processor, 64K of RAM, video chip, you know, the whole nine yards to make a full computer. And I must say the industrial design of this thing is a little different than most personal computers at the time. It kind of has like a stereo component look to it, almost like this would be a radio tuner or something like that. It has what looks like our fake screws. This is the power button. Uh, there's a reset button here. And obviously we have a power LED, a pause alert and a check light. On the rest of the front, you just have these little lines here and there it is, Nabu personal computer and two more fake screws. Build quality seems pretty nice. The whole front panel is plastic, but that's metal on the front and the sides. Obviously we have a built-in power supply. Here's the power lead permanently affixed. And then on the back panel, we can see that there are four expansion slots, so to speak. Taking a closer look, starting from the left, we have the adapter port, which would be the connector that goes to that second box that's actually plugged into your cable TV. Think of it kind of like a cable modem, so to speak. Next up is a printer port with an unusual number of pins. And then we have the keyboard connector, two removable plates, which would be for some kind of expansion. And then we have two RCA jacks for audio video output. And then we have a channel selector and then an input and an output for RF signal. So this thing must have an RF modulator and allow you to pass through your cable TV or your antenna, I guess. Although if you think about it, you need to have cable TV for this thing to even work because that's how you receive your software. So it allows you to pass your analog cable signal in and out into your TV. 
Then we have two more expansion covers here. And finally, it looks like we have a cooling fan over on the right side. On the bottom, we have a sticker. The Nabu Personal Computer Processor Unit, model NPC-2, and there's a serial number. I don't know if this is uh, unit number 300 or if it's 10,300. There's really not a lot of information on how many of these were actually sold. And I don't think it was very many. Taking a quick look at the topology in here, it's pretty well designed and it's pretty consumer friendly. The power supply here is very nicely shielded. So if you are an end user, you've opened this thing up, you have a low risk of getting an electric shock. Here is the RF modulator that feeds into an RF switch. So this is the pass through or switch. And there's a wire here that goes to the motherboard, which activates this. Next up, we have a TMS9918 video display processor. And if you're familiar with your TI chips, this is definitely the same chip that's used on the TI99, the ColecoVision. There's a Sega game console that uses it. And also all of those first MSX1 machines use this same chip. We're gonna see a little bit of a theme there. So just keep the MSX in mind as we look through the rest of the chips here. Right here next to the video chip is 16K of 4116 DRAM a typical memory configuration for this TI video display processor. Here we have an NEC 8251, which is almost certainly used probably for parallel I.O. for this printer port that's right here. Moving to the middle of the motherboard, here is the sound chip, the AY38910. Also, you'll be familiar with this chip because it's also used on a whole bunch of AD systems, including the MSX. Here we have a 40 pin dip that's made by WDC. And I'm not familiar uh, with what part this is. And then right here, you'll see a very familiar site. It's a Zilog Z80 CPU. Also conveniently, it's used on the MSX as well. Just next to that is a ROM chip. And then we have 64 kilobytes of RAM. So yes, this machine actually has 64K of main memory along with 16K of video RAM. Coincidentally, that is very similar to the MSX as well. Although I think the minimum RAM configuration on the MSX was potentially 16K or 32K. I'm not super up to date on my MSX architecture, but this machine certainly seems very similar to the MSX, at least on first appearance. And then over here on the left side of the motherboard are four expansion connectors. It's just like a pin header. So it's just kind of an inexpensive way to add an expansion connector. But I'm assuming that there were ribbon cables that would go from here to some type of module that would be screwed into the back of the case here where these little plates are. There also appears to be what looks like a power connector over here by the RF modulator, probably extra power to go to those modules as well. Now let's try to find some date codes on this machine. 8319 there. This one looks like 8341. So that puts it a little bit later in the year in 1983. The sound chip is the 39th week of 1983. And way up here by the CPU, there's a soldered IC that is the 48th week of 1983. So we can assume that this machine was at least built at the end of 1983 and potentially into 1984. In fact, right here along the front of the machine, it says 840101. So I don't know if that's like some kind of a serial number or if that's a day code, but that would make sense that this thing was made right at the beginning of 1984. We'll need to try to find some prices on what this thing might have cost originally when it came out. And you have to wonder like if part of it was subsidized by the cable company or by the software companies that were developing software for it that would be distributed over cable. But really the specs of this machine are pretty capable. The graphics chip in here actually has hardware sprites. That sound chip has multiple sound channels with like envelope and volumes and stuff like that. So it's not just like a beep speaker. And the fact is it actually has dedicated video RAM, which doesn't take away from your main memory and 64K of RAM. So if you're familiar with MSX computers, there are quite a number of good games on that system. All the right components are here with this machine for it to run MSX level software, which means that it's actually pretty capable. And depending on how much it costs when this thing was actually released back in 83 or 84, it could have been a pretty compelling choice. What I'd like to do next is take a look inside the power supply. Cause I do want to power this thing up, but of course, if there's reefer caps in there or something like that, uh, then we need to make sure we take those out first. I don't want to release the magic smoke into my basement as I've done many times before. It appears there are two screws over on this side and the two case cover screws, I think held the top cover down for the power supply. And there we have it. The NABU is equipped with a switch mode power supply. So definitely better quality or higher quality than something like on the Commodore 64. But I'd say by this point, 
new designs, probably all, well, I think they would have all been using switch mode power supplies, although it's definitely on the more expensive side because there still were a good number of computers that were coming out that used uh, linear regulators with transformers. One thing I can definitely see for sure is this computer is absolutely brand new and it's never been used. There is not a speck of dust inside of here. This fan is brand new and all of the components in the power supply also look brand new. I do not see a reefa cap. There's a few filter caps over here like mobs and stuff, but there's nothing reefa like so there's nothing to worry about there. And just a quick visual inspection, I don't see any leaking caps, which is a good thing. It should be pretty easy to see if they are leaking, there'd be a little bit of goop on the board and everything in here is looking absolutely fine. It does appear that the fan is 120 volt variety, so it's probably gonna be on the noisy side, but it does have a very nice smooth bearing. From a motherboard layout perspective, everything looks pretty good in there. I like the design, it's easy to work on. Not a lot of stuff is in sockets. Obviously the main large ICs are, but none of the RAM is. So if this thing has any kind of RAM issues, it's gonna require some desoldering to get those chips out of there. At least on this machine, they are TI and Motorola parts. So both of those are generally reliable. It's not like it's MT RAM. Why don't we just take a moment to take a look at this keyboard here, unbox it or unbag it, so to speak. Ooh, it is a quality feeling keyboard. Absolutely nice. Now it is plastic. It's not metal at all, but it's still pretty weighty. It's not like they've really cheaped out with the weight. I like the industrial design of it as well. And without a doubt, I'm gonna say that this is an Alps SKCC board. Let's pop off one of the keys here. SKCC is what's used on like the Macintosh app. Absolutely. That's it, that's the Alps SKCC switches. They are wonderful linear switches. They feel really good. And of course, because this board is brand new and never been used, this thing feels really nice. There's a very distinctive ping. When you type on it, you can hear like a ping sound that resonates inside the key switches, all of them. They kind of resonate off each other. And that's a very distinctive sound. And you can tell it's the Alps SKCC switches if you hear that ping. They appear to be the low profile stems, which is very similar to like the TRS-80 Model 3, plus the Alps keyboard that is on the TI-99 as well, uses those same switches. The Macintosh keyboards, like the Mac Plus, Mac 512, uses the same switch, but it uses a taller stem. So if you're gonna try to steal key switches off this keyboard, for instance, you're gonna have to swap the stem around, which is not too hard to take apart the switch and, and do that, but it won't immediately work. We have a pretty normal layout here. I mean, for something from the 80s, the delete key is right above the go key or the enter key. So that's a little bit unusual. And there's a TV NABU switch here, which obviously controls that RF switch for the pass through cable TV. Arrow keys are interesting here. It's got left and right, up and down. It's sort of a T shape, but it's turned on its side. There's a yes, no button, and then a button that looks like a fast left and right button whatever that's for. It's all pretty standard stuff actually. So typing on this would be relatively easy except for the fact that the delete key is in a weird spot. That's the only thing that's kind of unusual. And then of course the control key and stuff like that. But generally the feel and the layout is pretty wonderful, I gotta say. As you can see here, it has a removable DIN connector, which is probably one of those cables that was in the bag in the box there, and two joystick ports. So those are encoded through the keyboard signaling, which after doing a tiny bit of reading on this machine, it is encoded in some type of a serial signal, much like a regular PC keyboard is, and then sent to a keyboard controller or whatever that's inside that machine. Looking at the cables that came with it as well, we have an RF cable, and then this is obviously the keyboard cable. and. That is very long. I am gonna theorize that this is so long because they intended the NABU to be placed where your TV is and your cable TV signal, wire that is, and then you could sit on a couch with your keyboard and do couch computing, like home theater PC style. Although you're not gonna be watching any movies, you'd be playing games and stuff, but the fact that the joystick is encoded through the keyboard means that you just take the keyboard over to the couch with you, plug in the joystick, then you can be gaming away on the comfort of your couch. After taking a look at the motherboard design and the power supply, it seems like this thing is pretty much gonna be safe to power up. So why don't we power this thing up? I'll hook it up to the capture device. Let's just see what it does. Now, I'll preface this by saying I don't expect this thing to actually do much of anything because it needs to have its connection to the adapter box, which then gets all the information it needs to actually run this thing from the cable TV head end 
which clearly doesn't exist anymore. But at least, let's just see if it at least powers on and we're getting some kind of an image. I think there's probably some rudimentary diagnostics on here. So let's give that a try. Okay, we have the top-down camera in case anything goes boom and lets the smoke out. All right, the power cord is plugged into the wall. Power switch is right here. Here we go. Okay, the LEDs are on. That seems normal. Oh, hey, look at that. Nabu. <laughs> uh, I hear a little bit of sound. There was something coming out of the speakers, but that might just be background noise. Um, I guess that's it. We get nothing, just the Nabu logo with that purple color, which is very much the TMS video chip in here. Oh, oh, there was a beep, keyboard failure. Okay, I'm gonna plug in the keyboard. So <laughs> let's try this one more time. <laughs> I'm gonna estimate this cable's about 25 feet in length. Okay, it's beeped again. Uh, let's grab the keyboard. Okay, keyboard is connected to the back of the machine. Here, let's try again. Okay, there was a beep. Let me turn the volume up a bit more on the speakers. So lots of beeping there, actually. The audio level is quite quiet that comes out of the speaker, or at least those initial beeps were. So the TMS video, oh, there's a beep. Adapter failure, okay, so the keyboard passed its test. That's good to know. So if you're familiar with the TMS video chip, it has 16 colors, but they're kind of very muted colors. They're not like super vibrant, or at least some of them aren't. Uh, TI-99, of course, has the same exact colors, and so does the ColecoVision and stuff like that. Um, it's probably just gonna sit here and beep continually and complain that the adapter's missing because that is necessary for the computer to do anything. I'm just gonna mash on some keys here and see if it does anything. It doesn't seem like the keys do anything. The alert light is on on the front. I can hit the reset button. Interesting, there is a click, so there's some kind of a relay that's probably in the RF switch mechanism there, I would assume. So here the pause light is on, but the alert light's not on. Well, I think that's pretty much gonna be it for this power up test. I just wanted to make sure that this thing is functional. And I'm gonna say that basically it looks like it's working properly, at least as best as it can without its adapter connected and the network behind it. So we have a Wikipedia article about the Nabu network, which obviously would be the entire system that powers everything behind this computer. It calls it the precursor to the internet, <laughs> basically operate over cable TV from 82 to 85. And while the functionality was revolutionary, it was not a commercial success. We talked about how the Nabu with that additional box downloads its software over the internet, so there's no local storage like disk drives or tape drives. And it says here the Nabu can be credited as having the first online version of fantasy baseball. So if you're not familiar with fantasy sports, that's basically where you play with friends and you pick different players to be on your virtual team. And then basically as the games are actually happening, the scores that your players make while they're playing the real game, like in baseball, actually go towards your virtual team. I'm personally not really into sports. I haven't done a lot of these types of leagues, but I have lots of friends who are, and they put a lot of effort into curating their teams and making sure they have the best possible team to get the most possible points. Moving on, the article here talks about the price and it says it was nine or $50, pro presumably at launch, which was roughly the same price as the Commodore 64. So that would have been a very difficult sale, I think. Uh, Commodore 64 just had this incredible software library. And while when they both came out in 1982, the 64 probably didn't have a huge library yet, the fact is you could save your own programs onto disc or tape and had cartridges and things like that. And as you can see here, this had a monthly service fee for the Nabu network of eight to $10. It's hard to know exactly what you got with that, but I'm assuming you had access to a bunch of games and other software. And I suppose like any modern subscription service like Netflix or Spotify, you're gonna get access to new stuff all the time. So that's not necessarily a bad deal, but as a parent buying a computer for your kid, you think I could buy this 64, they can program in basic, and then the parent can buy a game or two, maybe wait for Christmas time or birthdays to do it, and you might spend 30 or $40, and then it's just the one time, and the kid can just play indefinitely. There's no monthly charges. Of course, we all know the Commodore 64 was wildly popular in North America, as were Apple IIs and other machines, and software piracy was a big thing. So it was very common for you to go meet your friends and copy discs or copy tapes so you could get access to software that you didn't necessarily buy. With something like this, that was clearly out of the question because there was just no way to actually get stuff onto this unless you were subscribed to the Nabu network. 
It says here that NABU stands for Natural Access to Bidirectional Utilities. Natural. Like, what's the deal with that? That is absolutely silly. It says the data was served over the network using a ground cell mini computer. I'm not actually too familiar with that. We're going to have to hover over it. Looks like with some 32 bit mini computer, obviously this sat in your cable TV head end, and then that would serve up all the software to all of these machines. What I am not totally sure about, maybe it will say this in the article, was the data connection that you had on this back to the head end bi-directional, like a cable modem, or is it really just a one directional connection like teletext was over in Europe? All right, and look at this. It's talking about the interface module, and it says there was an RF module that downconverted signals from the cable connection and upconverted requests to be sent to the server. So it was absolutely bi-directional. That is really cool. It's absolutely like cable modems, but way ahead of its time. Download speeds were up to 6.4 megabits per second. I have to imagine that was shared across like all of the devices that were on that cable TV head end. I don't know how accurate the information is in this article because I don't see citations with a lot of this stuff, but if it was really 6.4 megabits per second, that's really, really quite fast in the scheme of 8-bit computers. Next, we have a section on the actual commercial success of this product, and it seems like it was mainly available in Ottawa area, which I think we had read up above, and the project was heavily subsidized by the Canadian government. I'm really not surprised to see that it was subsidized just because looking at the construction quality of this thing, the switch mode power supply, the metal case, and that wonderful Alps keyboard, it's definitely going to cost a lot more to make this than the Commodore 64. And by the time the 64 came out, Commodore was already selling a ton of computers with the VIC-20, which was a wild success before. So they had already recouped a lot of the costs for making the 64, like the keyboard and the case design. They just reused that from the VIC-20. Really, it's just the motherboard and the RAM and stuff that's the big change on the 64. And this computer just would have cost a whole lot more to make. Going back to the article, it says here that a major weakness, at least initially, was that it was using a one-way connection. So that whole request and uh, serving of data thing it just wasn't implemented, at least with the Cablevision network. And according to this article, the reason for that one-way connection was really the cost required to upgrade the infrastructure to support that two-way. And that did come, of course, with cable modems, but cable companies had a lot to gain by charging quite a lot per month for internet access, and all those infrastructure upgrades were worth it to them. Now, the interesting tidbit here is it says a network was started in Japan as well. However, it never achieved commercial success and ceased operation in 1985. It doesn't really mention here when operation ceased in Canada. Although I think at the top of the article here, it did say something about, yeah, through 1985. I wouldn't be surprised if these networks were disappearing in Canada even before that. And perhaps this was a last gasp effort in Japan to get the NABU network working somewhere else and reuse some of this hardware. At the very end of the article here, there's a little tidbit on a display or a demonstration network that was set up at the York University in Canada. And there is some websites about this, which I did look at and we'll take a look at in a second. And unfortunately, they, I think, got this thing operating, but they never really released technical information on how the entire network works. It seemed to say that they would, but none of that information was ever forthcoming. Well, I clicked the link in Wikipedia to take me over to the NABU Network article, and for some reason it's in Ukrainian. Um, why exactly? <laughs> now we're over here on the York University website for the NABU Network, and take a look at this. A high volume offering of NABU PCs on eBay and other e-commerce sites has generated a tsunami of email from computer hobbyists. Now, believe it or not, even though this machine is super obscure, if you think about it, there's actually technical documentation that has been archived by Dave Dunfield. And there's a link to it here on the uh, Reconstruction Project website. And the funny thing is, I actually looked at this webpage, I don't know, like a week or two ago when I actually ordered this machine, and none of this stuff was up here. So I think uh, since they've gotten so many emails about it, they've updated their page with a little bit more information. Now, the information that Dave has on his webpage here is pretty good, but it's not the most up to date. And and I've actually been chatting with David a little bit, the same David who made the diagnostic ROMs for the TRS-80s, and he ordered one of these as, as well. And he's been diving into all the information he can find and scouring the internet trying to find other stuff. And since these machines came on the market, it seems like some more technical documentation has popped up beyond what Dave Dunfield has on his website. If you are interested in this machine, I recommend you take a look at this document and the other things that I link down below because it's absolutely a fascinating read. And it does talk a little bit about the network here and how it works, but also the architecture and the computer. 
And absolutely, this was not just thrown together as some random project. Definitely some care went into the design. And obviously the designers really had hoped that this thing would succeed, so it's a little bit of a travesty that it didn't. I'm not going to talk too much about the network, but here's just a brief overview of how it looks. So we can see the NABU head end and the regular cable TV head end, and they are combined together, and that goes over the cable TV network through the adapter, which is that second box I talked about, and then into the NABU PC. Back on the York University page, it talks about the fact that there's a downloadable operating system. So it's called DOS, but it's not for disk operating system. It's what's actually downloaded from the head end into the RAM on this thing to give it the functionality. And it sounds like the university had recreated this downloadable operating system. And it sounds like they're not necessarily ready to offer it up to anyone due to proprietary code. But I guess the document that's on Dave's website says here outlines the way the operating system works so you could recreate it. I think the idea with this machine is if we ever get any actual use out of it, we would have a replacement ROM for this that would actually give this local capabilities and wouldn't rely on talking to a cable TV head end or simulating the whole thing. I know that's the original design of this thing and having a simulated network up would be really cool to kind of experience it. But I think that this computer is quite capable on its own, just judging by the, the chips and the capabilities of the architecture here. And it would be pretty cool to get this thing actually running locally without the need for that remote system. Scrolling through the article here on the York University's website, it's pretty good actually. It talks about quite a lot of detail. And it says that by November, December, it looks like there were 140 titles available on the network. And it looks like there was a dedicated magazine and even Qbert was ported to this system at that point. And it looks like York has a little bit better information about when the system went offline. It looks like it lasted until 1986, August 1986 in Canada, before it went away due to financial difficulties. Further down, there's a couple screenshots of what the recreated network looks like. And I think I saw some screenshots of the original system and it said NABU in this uh, icon here as opposed to YUNN. But the whole interface looked very user friendly with like access to World of Games. And then you click that and you get BC Quest for Tires and Galaxian. And yes, I mean, if these games were actually running on the simulated network, that's pretty advanced. I have to wonder if those were ports from MSX machines or where the original code base was for those. You have to think that it was they were ports because the similarity of this to an MSX machine is just so striking that it was probably pretty trivial to get stuff working on this machine. Moving on from the York University website, it appears that in the last few days, someone has found and uploaded a NABU technical manual, which I don't know if this is first party or this was recreated at some point by someone looking to get this thing running again, but it seems very detailed. And what's fun is you can tell by the font that this looks, looks like it was created on a Macintosh. It has lots of technical information about the various chips and components in here, NTSC compatible, obviously. It says here that it's the keyboard that uses the 8251. So this is this chip right here. It's not the printer port as I thought. Looks like it runs at 6,992 baud using EIA RS422. The HCCA interface, that is that external box that basically connects to the cable TV head end. And it looks like it uses 111 kilobit per second stereo interface, also using RS422. So it'd be kind of cool if we could have a Raspberry Pi emulate that and feed data or software right into this thing as well. That would be a much easier way to recreate the head end than the complicated project that York University did back in 2009. What's cool about this technical manual, unlike the one on Dave's website, is actually list all the port numbers that everything is using. So like the video display processor is on A0 and A1. And then for instance, we have control registers right here. I think pretty much everything that's needed to actually replace the ROM on this with something else. The document has the pinouts for all of the ports on this thing and the expansion connectors on the motherboard as well. It has all of the information on how the keyboard works even, all the joystick ports and the communication protocol. So I would say it'd probably be possible to connect that keyboard up to a modern computer using an Arduino because all of the information is in here. Here's the NABU's memory map, and it looks like you can switch in and out up to 8K of ROM. I think this original ROM I remember reading is only a 4K ROM, but 8K is supported directly out of the box. And this document goes on to show all of the schematics in glorious like Mac Paint or Mac Draw looking graphics. That's pretty awesome, actually. 
On the very last page, there's a date, November 16th, 1989, which is intriguing because I'm actually making this video on November 16th, 2022. So someone did all this reverse engineering work at that point. I think this is well after Nabu, the company, was gone. And I don't know if this has been replicated from any official documentation that maybe someone had access to, but I have a feeling that someone just did a ton of reverse engineering work on this machine and the reverse engineer of the ROM and everything else to create this document. So hats off to whoever that was. Now, of course, you've watched up until this point, you have definitely come to the realization that this machine, pretty much as it sits at this time, is totally useless. While it's very capable, very well built, and you know has all those chips and RAM and all that neat stuff in there, there's just nothing we can do with it right now. So I'm hoping that videos like this and the inevitable other ones that are gonna get made are gonna spurn some interest in this machine and perhaps we can come up with a new ROM on this thing that will allow us to do a lot more with it than, well, the nothing that we can do with it right now. Perhaps at the minimum, we can fit a micro basic and a little or a little monitor or something like that into the 8K of ROM this thing can support right off the bat so we can at least get this thing booted and you know run some commands and have a little fun with it. Obviously, if we want to do more like interface a disk drive controller, that's going to take a little bit more of a circuit design. But because we have all that technical documentation for this machine, I don't think doing that would even be that hard. It's just a regular IO mapped expansion connector, which is very similar to a lot of other Z80 machines of the time. Reading through the manual here, which I didn't really show here, but what I'm going to do is scan this and upload it because I don't think anyone else has done it. It did show that there's actually a disk drive and a printer interface module for this machine. Now, in my reading, it said that the disk drive was only used for development purposes, but the fact that it's shown in the regular user's guide means that maybe they had it anticipated actually selling that to users to really expand the capabilities of this thing. Because of what I do here down in the basement, I like to think at this point in my life, I'm pretty knowledgeable about these old machines. And yet, it's amazing to me that stuff like this exists that I had no clue about and that someone had been sitting on a huge stock of these for all these years, and now they're just available for anyone to buy and play around with themselves. It really makes me wonder how many other hidden things like this exist that are just waiting to pop up and appear. Anyhow, if you'd like me to do anything else with this computer or try anything, let me know. I'm not sure I'm going to do a follow-up until maybe there's some more uh, reverse engineering that's done to this, or maybe some software becomes available, or we can do a little bit more with it. At the time I'm recording this, there are still plenty of these available on eBay for sale. I'm, I'm not affiliated in any way, by the way, with the seller. Of course, eventually those are going to go dry up, and then this video will exist out there as just uh, historical information, I suppose, about this machine. I'm really hoping that this is not the last video I do on the Nabo computer, so hopefully next time I do make one, we have some awesome developments that I can actually show off on this thing and turn this thing into the capable and usable 8-bit computer that it really is. So that's going to be it for this video. I want to thank all my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen over here. If you want to become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. Patrons get early access to videos and other behind-the-scenes stuff on the channel. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.